Please welcome Lily Singh. <laughs> conquer basically every aspect of media at this point. Your girl is getting her own NBC late night show! Late night talk shows have been a critical staple in the entertainment industry for the latter half of the past century. Whether you personally tune in or not, it's hard to dispute the sheer cultural significance such a phenomenon holds over the way we consume media. You've definitely heard names like Johnny Carson, Conan O'Brien, David Letterman, who have all been familiarized by the captivating nature and versatility of late night television. Despite undergoing a myriad of new changes and developments over the years, we see the same basic fundamental format still practiced in late night to this very day. With a few exceptions, of course. But even still, late night television has and always will be one of the most beloved and traditionalized pieces of Western media. Unless, of course, it's ruined by YouTubers. You remember Lily Singh, don't you? I mean, with 14 million subs and 3 billion collective views, she's kind of hard to forget. Lily started her YouTube channel, I I Superwoman, I I, in October of 2010. And in all my years of following YouTubers, I still have no idea why there's an I I before and after her name. It looks terrible, Lily. I, I hate to break the news. But the aesthetic issues of her pseudonym hardly stopped her from becoming one of the earliest pioneers of the website, as well as Forbes' 10th highest paid YouTuber, with a net worth estimated in the eight figures. Yeah, 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 you heard that right. Being such an accomplished figure in the media, you'd have to assume she's got the skills to back it up, right? I mean, Lily was noted as one of the 40 most powerful people in comedy. That's not something to sneeze at, all right? That's a pretty big deal. So what kind of stuff does she even make then? Oh, uh, now I see. In essence, you could say she's one of those comedy channels that falls into that category between safe and mature content. She's a lot like Liza Koshy and Lele Pons, where they awkwardly wrap exceedingly crude adult level humor in this weird family friendly package. I swear to God, if you don't just go over there and hook up with them, I'm gonna start to go fund me for your vagina. I mean, without children, none of these channels would be anywhere. Despite most of the subject matter being so inappropriate, it probably shouldn't be directed at kids, much less promoted by YouTube themselves, but <laughs> that's another story. My blood pressure can only take so much. <laughs> The bottom line is, there's a market for this comedy, and Lily has clearly found a way to profit off these edgy kids who think Tee vagina, ooh penis, hee racial stereotypes. Which I admit, I was one of those kids too. When I was 11, you know, it just doesn't seem to me like Lily has a target audience in mind. Her stuff seems tailored for older teens, but I just can't see anyone over 14 enjoying her. Then again, there are real adults who enjoy this. They shouldn't be in America. No one but me in America. No taxes for me in America. This is my natural Erica. But half-baked comedy is not all Lily is known for. See, our pal here has actually gotten herself into a few uh-ohs in the past. A couple of snafus, if you will. A little bit of a pickle. Let's just say she ain't a stranger to the old apology notes tweet. You know who really needs to be in this rewind video? Everyone who managed to do something bigger than themselves this year. 
who found a way to help the causes that matter to the most. YouTuber entitlement. It's nothing new. Everybody with a following on this website is vain or conceited to some extent. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing YouTube, and if they tell you otherwise, they're lying. But those who try to hide their narcissism behind a sheer veil of dishonesty and falsehoods often create a sort of divide between them and their audience, aggrandizing themselves in the most manufactured, elitist way possible. And that's where Lily kicks it up to another level. In December of 2018, Forbes published a list of the year's highest paid YouTubers, with names including Markiplier, PewDiePie, Dude Perfect, Ryan's Toy Reviews, as the highest earning creators of the past fiscal year. However, out of all of the top 10 spots, there were no women, an observation Lily was quick to make on Twitter. Now, as you can imagine, this tweet was not well received, as it's important to reiterate, Lily Singh is already a multi-millionaire. So let me just ask, how many people do you know who are lucky enough to bring in seven figures a year and still complain about an arbitrary and probably falsified list by a magazine no one under 40 even looks at? Probably not many. Lily's forced victimhood was understandably called out by a myriad of creators and viewers alike, forcing her to type out a half-assed apology tweet loaded with a plethora of vague backpedaling for some quick brownie points. It's just this type of fake motivational bullshit from YouTubers that really aggravates me. If you already have more success or money than you know what to do with, nobody wants to hear you complain about representation. It just comes off so incredibly disingenuous and honestly turns people away from causes like feminism in general. As much as I rail on YouTube, they actually do offer a lot of opportunities for women and minorities in entertainment because success is primarily curated by the viewer. There's already an overwhelming number of stunningly successful women on YouTube and just because none of them made it onto Forbes' top 10 list of 2018 doesn't mean they aren't making more money than most people will ever see in their lives. In an industry that relies so heavily on algorithmic promotion, of course the creators who work the hardest are likely going to be the ones on top. The algorithm is a game, and if you want even a sliver of success to come from your channel, then you have to play it. And from the looks of things, Lily, you've been a little busy with separate ventures outside of YouTube, so it's really no wonder you weren't on the list. I'm like, yo, YouTube is one part of me, but I got my production company. I got girl love stuff. I just spoke at the United Nations. I'm sending girls to school. I got some acting stuff going on. I wrote a book. I'm working on all these side projects. Whether she's going after racist white guys in her comment section or the patriarchal undertones of this very website, this sort of fake moral grandstanding doesn't tend to sit well with a lot of people. So when she announced her new NBC late night show in early 2019, it wasn't pretty. But first, we have a sponsor. Y'all remember Ray J, right? I I started Raycom with one goal, and that was to shake up the wireless audio industry to its very core. Of course he did. Well, it turns out he actually co-founded a company called Raycon. I'm actually wearing their headphones right now as I edit this video, because there ain't no wires to get tangled up in. Not only are they great quality, but they start at about half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds on the market. So fuck AirPods, man. Fuck Beats. Fuck Galaxy Pods, whatever the f Their latest model, E25, is their best yet. With six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a more compact design that gives you a nice noise isolating fit. Click the link in the description below to get 15% off your order with code Aubrey. Massive thanks to Raycon for helping me pay rent since lovely Susan hates everything I stand for. Speaking of standing, you know what I can't stand? This. Get ready for the most terrifying iteration of the Joker yet. A lady. Hey, are you going into the men's room? Oh, yeah, there's someone in the women's, so. But you're a woman. You don't belong in there. That's our room. We have rules, and we have to follow the rules. We don't follow the rules. Because chaos! How did I get this job? Hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I started with a couple unpaid internships in college. Working hard, you know, staying late, volunteering for the party committee. Because, you know, women are socially expected. Imagine the company got sued for gender discrimination and begrudgingly agreed to promote me to manager. Four years. Dan? 
the beginning of 2019, our friend somehow managed to swing her own late night show on a major mainstream network at that. Now, if you're like me, you probably had pretty mixed emotions going into it. On one hand, it is genuinely impressive for not just a YouTuber, but a woman of color to obtain her very own program on mainstream television. Most YouTubers who are lucky enough to make it on TV only last a couple months, and most late night talk show hosts are crackly old straight white men. As much as I dislike Lily as an entertainer, it's counterproductive to ignore the cultural significance of what she's doing, and I think it's beneficial to find common ground on what we consider commendable. But with all that out of the way, she is a terrible, terrible comedian. Yeah, I am so happy to be here. And by the looks of it, a lot of you are happy to be here too. <laughs> it's, it's mostly the brown people because this was free to attend. But I know for sure some people at home are looking at their TVs just like, is something wrong with my TV? Why are they playing Slumdog Millionaire after Seth Meyers? But now that I'm in this position, I'm super excited to help pave the path. And as a woman, I'm especially stoked to join this group of people. <laughs> Okay, all right, okay. So as you can probably tell, Lily's got a little case of the Schumer syndrome, where all of her material is focused on one f***ing thing. Only instead of vaginas, it's white people. Choose desired outfit, now we're talking. Mmm, ball gown, okay. A little overkill though. Maybe for when I win my Emmy. Which, let's be real, it's inevitable, because a whole bunch of older white people voting for a brown girl will help them get praise from the media. Which, don't get me wrong, I love laughing at white people. I think my fellow whites deserve to be made fun of for the cacacity of naming their kid Paisley or Jackson with two X's. But if you're going to make jokes centered around someone's identity, just, just please make it funny. I'm of the belief that nothing is sacred and that everything should be left on the table when it comes to comedy, but if you're going to make a joke at the expense of someone's race, just be creative. Yeah, that's all you gotta do. Just, just be funny, please. Writers. Writers. Doesn't seem to be many options. Let's try this. Yes! Where am I? Now this is the type of representation we should be seeing in 2019. Oh, is this a callback audition for quirky best friend of a white lead? No! You're the writers on my new show. For Netflix India? No. For NBC. For NBC. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god. So, I think most respectable people can agree that representation in the workplace is a positive thing. You want a diverse group of employees for obvious reasons, but you also shouldn't downplay the importance of, you know, credentials, the thing that actually makes you certified for a job. I don't know if this was just a failed attempt at a joke or if she actually did this, but hiring someone solely on the basis of their skin tone and not their qualifications is a, a little, well, uh, what's the word? It's it's right on the tip of my tongue. Oh, crap. I swung the pendulum too far. I hate when that happens. Fine, you get one. Can't spell me too without me. <laughs> She's acting like there's no diversity in the media today whatsoever. Like we're back in the early 2000s or some shit. It's honestly insulting how she acts as if she's the one paving the way for all this representation. You know, the representation that we already kinda have. I look like the Migos. Yeah, white people are gonna skirt all the way to another channel to watch Duck Dynasty. Aha, uh -huh. yes, queen. I understand that for some people, <clears throat> white people, <laughs> seeing someone like me host a show is terrifying. <laughs> Hashtag not my Carson Daly. <laughs> but honestly, maybe I'm just the beginning. Maybe all of your favorite movies and TV shows are gonna get a minority remake. The opening monologue on her very first night kind of embodies everything I was anticipating her to be. I think most people who are familiar with her style were kind of expecting this from her, but that doesn't make it entertaining. But in all seriousness, maybe I shouldn't be joking about this because, I mean, one of the biggest fears of white America is that minorities are coming to take their jobs, you know what I mean? And honestly, we are. <laughs> Let's be real, Lily. The actual racists out there aren't going to be watching your show anyway. It doesn't make you look good and actually has a tendency to turn your audience against you, which it already has. So what it, what what are you doing? They wear the towels, you know, the turby twist, so they look like super not cool in the turby twist, but it dries their hair really quickly. So, you know, it's, it's a very practical thing. I think they definitely had the turby twist okay. on when they... But they look like my Punjabi friends. It's but they were like... <laughs> uh.
A complete show on bashing white people. Oh wow, how original. So much fun at every white person's expense, but it's okay, right? Disgusting. She's weak and does not have an original funny joke to save her life. She is the joke. I'm sorry, but this is just not funny. It's painful to watch. The applause sign really gets a workout on this show. I guess this show is not made for me. I wish them good luck, but if this is woke comedy, then I'm out. This show is downright appalling in its unfunniness, production, and entertainment value. It was actually hard to watch. However, it was so bad that it's comical to see in a world full of terrible talk show hosts, we found one even worse. That one cuts deep. Y'all, your host is a woman of color. Okay, get ready for this. <laughs> Ads like this are the reason why we need more young people in the workforce. Even the kid on the right knows this wasn't a good choice. <laughs> He's like, I know I'm only eight years old, but that sweater is extremely problematic. <laughs> Meanwhile, the other kid is like, oh great, another white savior. <laughs> As I think you can tell by now, an overwhelming majority of Lily's material focuses on identity comedy, which already alienates a large demographic on its own. But it's also the delivery that I find so excruciating. It's not necessarily the fact that she's a liberal or a feminist that pisses a lot of people off. It's the way she shoves her identity down her audience's throat, which is annoying no matter what you believe politically. Let's look at somebody who's been on the late night scene for a long time now. Conan O'Brien has been a television host for for about 25 years. And to many people, he's also one of the only good late night comedians left. So what is it that makes him so appealing to everyone regardless of their personal identities? For starters, Conan isn't a polarizing figure. He's actually pretty inclusive with a lot of his material and doesn't strive to alienate an entire demographic based on fickle political leanings. For the most part, he knows how to keep divisive societal issues out of his jokes because that just isn't what he's trying to do. And even when he is political, he's not antagonizing. I think a lot of late night shows have sort of morphed a little bit so that sometimes there's comedy, but then they've become much more political. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, it's just different. I have strong political views and thoughts about things that I'm passionate about, but I choose not to go that way. But I feel like we're all put here to do different things. And it's really, I don't think it's why I was put here is to passionately tell people what I think politically. I very much got into late night comedy because I wanted to do weird, silly things that made people giggle. He wants the audience on his side, as any comedian or entertainer should. But since Conan is in fact a straight white male, let's use Ellen DeGeneres as another example. Even if you don't personally watch her yourself, you have to admit how likable she is. For decades, Ellen has been adored by tens of millions, and that isn't by accident either. She has a certain charm to her that even her critics can't ignore. And again, similar to Conan, she doesn't antagonize anyone because she realizes that in order to be effective, she needs to be liked and respected. In the words of the great Johnny Carson, The most important thing to me, I think, is the empathy that you have to have for the performer. I think this is the greatest thing that a performer can have if he's going to be successful as an entertainer, is an empathy with the audience. They have to like him. They have to like him. And if they like the performer, then you've got 80% of it made. Lily hasn't quite figured that out yet, it seems. And part of that could still be the fact that she is new to this. At the time of me recording this, her show has only been around for about a month. So of course she needs time to grow and develop a feel for her audience. However, that will take some serious self-examination before anything begins to change. Now, there are a lot of things about women's fashion that I just find baffling. Like pantyhose, can we just take a moment? <laughs> You spend $30 on a nice pair, and the moment you put them on, you got a rip from your ankle to your crotch instantly, okay? You only get to use them one time, like condoms. <laughs> I mean, they're also like condoms in that it feels better when you're not wearing them. <laughs> I don't want to see Lily Singh's show fail. It's impressive enough that she's made it this far in her career, and it goes without saying that she's incredibly fortunate to be in the position she's in, which is what makes it so frustrating that she doesn't do more to make it something special. Here she is with an incredible opportunity to do something profound with her platform, and yet she's fallen into the same nightly routine as most modern talk show hosts. Only she's found a way to be even more unenjoyable than the majority of her competition. She's not only telling bad to mediocre jokes, 
she's doing so in the most antagonistic way imaginable, alienating the very branch of her audience that she's trying to educate. Which would be fine, I guess, if it weren't for the fact that ignorant people aren't going to be swayed to your side through hostility. If anything, that'll just push them further into bigotry and prejudice. Lily is only granting more ammunition to her critics by being as smug and unlikable as possible. Her jokes only do so much as to turn potential viewers away, and I only hope that she's able to realize and correct this issue before it becomes too late. Because not everyone is lucky enough to inherit such a massive platform. It's only within reason to ask that you use it wisely.